All right. So in the last um, short lecture, we talked about the rise and spread of Islam. And even though technically that falls outside the purview of your syllabus, uh, I thought it might be a good idea to do a quick recap from the 7th century start of Islam right up to our starting point in the syllabus, which is the 1500s, where we are going to talk about Islamic empires. Now, there's three Islamic empires that uh, we will cover under our discussion. And you notice that we have on the screen Ottoman, Safavid, and Mughal. Um, your handout tells you about the origin uh, or the foundation of the empires and then how they achieve the pinnacle of their glory and the reasons for their success and ultimately the causes of failure. So the first empire we're talking about is the Ottoman Empire. Um, I would assume by now you've had a quick cursory reading of your text and so you know a little bit about the origin. You know that you can trace the origin back to the Mongol period and then a section of the Mongol Tatars, the Golden Horde, settled in what you would recognize as, uh, I guess, Turkey, uh, old Anatolia, um, and from the old, larger Seljuk Empire, uh, Ottoman or Uthman, Latinized or Europeanized to sound like Ottoman, Uthman declared independence. And from that point onwards, an independent Ottoman Empire flourished um, a little to the southeast of the Black Sea. And then it began to occupy an area that covered right up to the borders of present-day Iran, uh, far east as, as the borders of Iran, and as far west-southwest as North Africa. Um, in terms of the continent of Europe, the Ottoman Empire encroached on the borders of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, in fact made two forays into the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and both times the Austrian Empire was saved by freakish thunderstorms, otherwise the Ottoman Empire would have had a far more expansive territory. Um, the dynastic takeover of Constantinople began in 1453, and it was by Sultan Mehmet the Conqueror. And again, your text goes into a wonderful description of that conquest. And we have, uh, as an additional resource, a video that uh, I've um, posted a link to, and that is Islam, the Islamic Empires, Part 3, the segment at the very end deals with the Ottoman takeover of Constantinople and the ultimate flourishing of the Ottoman Empire. So by this time in the 15th century, not only have they taken over the port city of Constantinople, they have stopped effectively all land trade further east, hence the need for the circumventing of that ban and the sea route that takes the Portuguese and Spanish ships across the Pacific by way of going south in the Atlantic, skirting the west and the south coast of Africa, going further east into the Indian Ocean, and then landing in their desired territories in the east or in Asia, um, in the Arab world and in Asia. Um, in terms of expansion west, the Ottoman Empire includes um, an encroachment into what you'd recognize as future Bulgaria and Serbia, uh, parts of Greece, the Hungarian section of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, Romania, the southern part of Poland, and South Russia. And from as far south as Morocco to Iran, the Ottoman Empire then extended its boundaries. Primarily responsible for these massive conquests was one of the descendants of Sultan Mehmet the Conqueror, Sultan Suleiman the Magnificent, which by the 16th century is synonymous with the greatness of the Ottoman Empire. Very efficient administrative structure was set up with allocation of portfolios and power that's distributed amongst ministries. Um, who then owed their responsibility to 
the Grand Prime Minister or the Vizier, and there was also a religious component of this political authority figure that was the Grand Mufti and the Ulema or the priesthood. And together they main, maintained the structure of power intact. And they had very efficient um, um, department um, control by the center, but they also knew how to allocate power to the right department so that there was a Ministry of Tourism, there was a Ministry of Finance, there was a Ministry of Agriculture, and there's of course the ministry that oversaw proceedings that would benefit them militarily. One of the grand adventures of the Ottoman Empire was the creation of the Janissary Corps, their infantry corps, and that infantry corps expanded by leaps and bounds, and it had um, uh, reconnaissance groups, it had mobile permanent corps that would go out and in advance of an um, approaching army, uh, an approaching Ottoman Turkish army, that is, would find out information about the terrain, the logistics, and come back and then prepare to launch an attack. Um, your text goes into a lot of details about siege warfare, so I will not repeat that same information. Um, all of these techniques and tactics help them to achieve their grandiose empire by the early 16th century, which was really their peak point. Um, the decline begins after people like Selim the Saad and his successors. And now with a name like Selim the Saad, you can imagine that he's by no means as grandiose as uh, Suleiman the Magnificent. The name gives away a lot. Now, this is because people like Selim the Saad had been sheltered from learning the techniques of administration because there was always a fear in a lot of these empires that the next in line would actually preempt uh, the rule of the earlier uh, authority figure and um, shove him off the throne, um, usurp power. And so they were kept in the dark rather than train them so that the administration had a continuity they would be sheltered and shielded and given a lot of unnecessary duties, often actually even imprisoned, um, so that they would not be able to interfere in the succession or, or interrupt the succession. So people like Selim the Saad would not be trained for the job, the office, and then when they come to office, if they also have a pension for alcohol or something even more potent, then the problem is even more um, catastrophic. And so Salim the Saad spent most of his time in a state of drunken stupor and not mm, was not inclined towards you know looking after the welfare of this grandiose empire that Salim and the Magnificent had built. And from that point onwards, the decline sets in. If you compare the Safavid Empire, which is directly to the east of the Ottoman Empire, its foundation was by Shah Ismail. And now the, the, um, the Ottoman Turks were um, Sunni Muslims. The last time we talked about the Shia Sunni split in the 7th century. Um, the Safavid were um, Shias. In fact, this was the first time that would be a majority Shia rule in Iran. And that was primarily the focus of Shah Ismail. And he felt that for the longest time, with the antecedents being Turkish, a lot of Afghan influence, a lot of Mongol influence, a lot of back and forth between whether these emperors would adopt Christianity or um, even Lamaism, Buddhism. Now he wanted a consistent faith, and that consistent faith was going to be the core of the empire. And so this was achieved under Shah Ismail and continued uh, under Shah Abbas, at which point the empire reaches its ultimate peak of glory. So what Suleiman the Magnificent was for the Ottoman Empire, you can pretty much draw a parallel here and say that Shah Abbas was for the Safavid Empire. Um, multiple ethnicities had um, been the, um, the um, cause of multiple ethnic warfares in uh, the old empire of Persia. Um, European intrusions into the trade had also caused a lot of new dimensions of conflict, as again your text in the human record talks about um, 
And so uh, Shaish Ma's focus was on creating a very homogenous group with a common loyalty. The emphasis was on a linguistic unity, a religious unity, with a newly restructured, redesigned capital in Ishfahan. I noticed there is a spelling error. It's not Ashfahan. Um, it's Ishfahan. The A should be changed to an I. There's also a lot of emphasis on art and architecture, textile production, rug making, um, ceramics, and, and uh, the uh, art of pottery was uh, at its greatest height during the Safavid Empire, and particularly in the 17th century. The decline comes uh, early on in the 18th century, um, again, with the same principles that guided the, the Ottoman Empire there was much fear from um, possible succession rifts and um, succession disputes, and so um, future rulers were kept in the dark. And part of this unpreparedness for actual domestic administration also played a part in terms of how badly equipped they were to deal with the foreign advance. And so a combined Turkish-Afghan attack in the early 18th century did the rest, and while the empire has already um, had started to decline under more inept rulers than Shah Ismail and Shah Abbas, uh, by the early 18th century a foreign attack finished the empire. The Mughal Empire is the third going further east from Iran into present-day India, India and Pakistan and Sri Lanka all grouped together. Uh, would have been called South Asia, and the Mughal Empire actually stretched in the north um, from as far west as parts of Afghanistan and Pakistan today to as far east as Bengal, so from the Arabian Sea to the Indian Ocean. And if you looked further south from the northern tip of Kashmir, it reached up to the Vindhya Mountains in central India. And the founder of this grandiose empire was Babur. Babur came from a small state in Afghanistan, Fergana, and that is what connects the three Islamic empires because there is mixed Iranian, Turkish, Afghan influence in the rule of the Mughal emperors. The first battle of Panipat that he won against the indigenous groups who were far superior in number, but even with a small group, Baba was successful because he used modern-day weaponry, and he was able to procure these um, from a variety of states in Europe and from the Ottoman Turkish Empire, and so he won an army against an army that was ten times bigger. Um, the height of the glory of the Mughal Empire was reached under Akbar, who was the third in line. Baba didn't last very long. He always pined for and mourned for the lost state of Fergana from where he hailed, but he laid down the blueprint of the great architectural accomplishments that one uh, associates with the Mughal Empire today. The gardens, the layout of the cities, the big mosques, those were all started by Baba, but the empire reached its peak of glory under Akbar the Great, in the mid 16th century. So if you're going to look for parallels, then Ottoman Empire and Suleiman the Magnificent will be a great match with Shah Abbas and the Safavid Empire, as will Akbar, in terms of where the Mughal Empire reaches its height. So three great stalwarts, Suleiman, Shah Abbas, and Akbar. Um, Akbar was a political genius, realized that he was ruling a largely uh, Hindu subcontinent, and um, the introduction of Islam might create religious conflict. So he advocated religious toleration, uh, created an efficient bureaucracy composed of both Muslims and Hindus, and as he expanded, he made sure that administration-wise, in terms of political advice, he had the input of both Hindus and Muslims. He himself proposed a religion, Din-e-Ilahi, and Din-e-Ilahi was this, this noble endeavor which took principles um, of almost every world religion 
and he realized as an intelligent man that most world religions don't go out and say, commit murder, God will love you, or thou shalt steal and be granted a place in heaven. And so the common sense approach he took, um, taking major statements from every world religion, created this all-inclusive universal faith that administrators, civilians alike, were um, urged to adopt. Mostly the common folk did not understand such a high lofty idea, but intellectuals praised Akbar for his foresight and for the ability to create this eclectic religion that would transcend all ethnic, religious, linguistic tension. Um, the grandeur of the empire was um, evident from all of the architectural accomplishments, particularly the capital city that was a few miles away from the traditional capital that was always at Delhi, and he moved that capital to Fatehpur Sikri. Um, the um, empire reached a state of decline in the hands of less competent rulers, um, and even though Akbar, for example, would be succeeded by administrative and political geniuses like Jahangir and Shah Jahan, um, Shah Jahan is the one who was responsible for the creation of uh, the Taj Mahal, which has remained to this day one of the uh, wonders of the world. Their foresight did not um, match that of Akbar. And whatever iota foresight you see in Aurangzeb, you see that within the first few years of his reign, he seems to have been devoid of this. And by the early 18th century, he is so intent on expanding the empire, even at the cost of diplomacy, at the cost of this eclectic faith that Akbar had built, the, um, the camaraderie that had been established between the Hindus and the Muslims, that he encroaches into southern India, which thus far had been the bastion of Hindu civilization, protected from all Muslim incursions. The um, dress, language, um, music, the architecture, the cuisine, they were all um, influenced by Hindu and Muslim contributions, um, as also the other aspects of, of an Islamic world, like, for example, Persian architecture, and Persian architects were actually even brought into the um, uh, Mughal Empire, um, and a lot of the constructions were influenced by Persian styles and Persian motifs. So as you look at the causes of success and look at the causes of failure, you'll find they're pretty much the same in terms of the factors. So what led to the success was a centralized administration, a very efficient bureaucracy, an army that was greatly expanding with the resources of these imperial authority figures, and there was an organized center. It was all an urban atmosphere, I'm not suggesting that there was no agriculture at all in certain countries like in India. In the Mughal Empire, there was a combination of both agrarian and commercial wealth, but there's a large emphasis on trade, and the commercial wealth is what created the grandiose empires, the buildings, the inviting of scholars and artists and diplomats from all over the world. Um, the intellectual iron curtain that's going to be set up is at first very helpful because it helps them to undertake more or less a renaissance of their own and focus on scholarship and exchange of ideas. But eventually that same intellectual curtain is going to lead to intellectual stagnation as when in 1450, when you compare, for example, what's accomplished in, say, the European continent and what's accomplished in the Islamic empires, in Persia, in Turkey, in India, you find that in 1450, it's on the same level. But by the time you come to 1750, already the advances of the scientific revolution and the industrial revolution have taken over um, some of the developments in Europe and they've created a gap in terms of achievement between the Islamic world and the European world. And this is by no means suggesting that there was no um, technological advancement going on in the Islamic world. There was. 
um, and it was traced far earlier than the technological development you see in the uh, European continent, but it was not at a sustained pace nor at this you know, exponential growth level that you witness in Europe. Also, the commercial wealth that led to the success of the three Islamic empires we have just talked about, that commercial wealth was not going to match the commercial wealth of the West, of Europe, now that they have gotten into um, a world of trade, uh, a trade that involved the Atlantic and the Pacific. And the massive amounts of profit that first the Spanish and the Portuguese and thereafter the Dutch accumulated and then the English and the French took over, that was by no means comparable to the kind of wealth that was land-based trade, uh, that was a result of land-based trade in the Islamic empires. So, like I said, ironically, the causes of success will actually also be the causes of failure, as you find that centralized monarchy, if it's not run by an efficient monarch or a series of inept monarchs, that's going to cause a domino effect and is going to cause decline from the center to the periphery. It will spread everywhere in the empire. The economic uncertainty that's going to emerge after the Spanish-Portuguese takeover of um, the commercial enterprises, um, which will undercut the profit that land-based trade and traders in the Islamic world uh, were blessed with, that's going to cause a difference in accomplishment, a difference in investment in technology, for instance, or pursuit of scientific knowledge. And so that will result in um, more of an advancement in terms of science and technology, at least, in the, um, in the European world. And so as you make these comparisons, look into what we have already discussed in the context of um, new monarchy in Europe, capitalism, um, and the explorations, and then compare the achievements of the Islamic empires and the reasons why these achievements don't continue at a sustained pace during the same period in the 17th, 18th century that Europeans seem to be getting the edge over the rest of the world. Thank you.